So I'd love to hear Richard speak today. He's been coming to our meetings for quite some time. He's given past workshops and presentations to us. You can find him online on our website. Um, he's an amazing individual um, and he, he comes with a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Richard, um, please go ahead. Everybody, uh, uh, I am a uh, grateful and enthusiastic member of Codependence Anonymous. My name is Richard and I'm Codependent as hell. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, the committee for, for inviting me back. Uh, it's, it's always an honor and a privilege to be asked to speak anywhere in Codependence Anonymous. I see on the screen right now uh, my friend Sharon A. who, who uh, asked me to speak at an event a couple of years ago. Um, uh, she put me in the time slot directly behind Ken and Mary. And I, and I think I, I gave the opinion at that time that one of the most intimidating things you can say to a speaker in Codependence Anonymous is you're following the founders. Well, apparently my higher power heard that because he's having me walk through it. Um, today we're, we're going to talk about uh, sponsorship. Um, we talk about sponsorship a lot in CODA, but we're going to talk today about an aspect that I don't think gets talked about very often. Uh, just about every sponsorship workshop that I've ever been in uh, was really focused on how to become a sponsor, what to do when you are a sponsor, how to sponsor. Uh, and yet, when I was new, I was taught that... Uh, I am responsible for precisely 50% of the successes and 50% of the failures in my relationships, no more, no less. Which means that as a sponsee, I am 50% responsible for that relationship with my sponsor. And we don't really talk about how to maximize that relationship, how to get the most out of my relationship with my sponsor very often. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is, is my experience. Um, uh, I should tell you that that uh, the Monday after Mother's Day was my 18th Coda birthday, so I've been here for for a, a bit, uh, and I've had the opportunity to make some observations and draw some conclusions, and that's I'm going to share that with you today. And I need to tell you right up front that your mileage may vary. That nothing that I say should be construed as as uh, in any way. Um, a contradiction of, of what works for you. Right. Um, uh, our preamble talks about this is an individual growth process. Uh, and and at, just because something works a certain way for me or that, or that I've come to a certain conclusion doesn't mean that, that, that that's the only way to do things. Uh, I, I need to be very upfront about that. And with that, you know, we'll get into it here. Um, I like to describe sponsorship as the catalyst of recovery. Now, what, what does that mean? If you think back to when you were in, in your high school chemistry classes, uh, uh, a catalyst is that substance that either initiates or accelerates a chemical process. And that's what, that's what sponsorship has been in my recovery. I really didn't get anywhere in my recovery until I got a sponsor. And then my recovery accelerated. Um, over the years, my recovery would kind of plateau. And then I got a different sponsor and my recovery accelerated again. Uh, and that's happened a couple of times for me. Becoming a sponsor caused my recovery to accelerate. It doesn't matter which side of the equation I'm on. It's, it's been my experience that, that, that sponsorship makes my recovery move. Uh, the uh, booklet, Sponsorship, What's in it for me, has a pretty good description that recovery from codependence cannot be done alone. Allowing another person to sponsor us provides us with a safe place to practice being in a relationship. Over time, permitting someone to get to know us through self-disclosure, working with CODA steps and traditions, and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable offers a new perspective about intimacy and trust. The way I think about, uh, about a sponsor 
is that if you are dropped off in the wilderness and you want to get from point A to point B, um, and, and you know there's this, this dark foreboding forest in front of you, and you need to get through that forest in order to get to your destination. One of the most useful things you can have in that situation is a guide, someone who's been through the paths in the forest and knows how to get to point B. And that's what the sponsor is for me, someone who has walked the path already that I want to walk. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a heads up right now. Uh, in prepping for this thing, I have, I have been baffled by how, how scattered I feel this week. So uh, there, there might be the odd couple of uh, pauses as I have to gather my thoughts. So for that, that's not my usual style as some of the people here can tell you, and I, I do apologize. Why is it so important for me to have a sponsor? Well, for starters, if, if I don't have a sponsor, then I'm sponsoring myself. I'll put a little graphic up on the screen here. Um, this is what self-sponsorship looks like. Okay. See, the thing is that I get here uh, with a broken thinker. You know, uh, mine is a disease of perception. The, the way that my codependence affects me is that it's a, it changes the way I see the world around me. It affects my thinking. And, and consequently, uh, what's going on in my head should never ever be confused with, re with the reality of what's actually going on around me. Uh, because that's my illness at work. And a sponsor is somebody who is, is uh, not immersed in, in the drama of my life. It's not attached to my baggage. And here's the other thing that I would like to share to explain that. And some of you have seen this before because I find that it's useful in a couple of different workshops. Uh, bottom line is that uh, you know, I have all of this stuff going on. I, I am, I am uh, constantly dogged by fear. I, I, I have parts of my, uh, of my head that are, are in resentment and in uh, uh, anger and in blaming and victimhood. And there's, there's this tiny little voice of reason here, which by the way is too small to see at the scale. That's my solution center at work. That's, that, that is the, the, the computing machine that was in charge of my life before I got here and what that got me was a, was a nervous breakdown in 12 step meetings. And what a sponsor is, is somebody that I can turn to, who I can check my thinking with, who, who I can take what I think is going on, what I, whatever it is that I propose to do, whatever problem it is that I'm, I'm dealing with and filter it through, through the lens of the perception of somebody who's not immersed in it and who wants the best for me. That's what a sponsor brings to the party for me. And uh, the big deal there is that, you know, I could, I could do the sponsor myself thing, the sawing off the, the, the branch I'm st standing on. I have never in 18 years seen anybody get better in a meaningful and sustainable way here, unless until, less than until they were willing to do it someone else's way. Um, that's a lesson that I need that I need to keep close. That I need to remember that that uh, me driving the bus is a recipe for wreckage, and so I need to look elsewhere for my solutions. Because if I don't do that, I'm stuck with the solution center that got me here in the first place. Another thing that's important for me uh, to have a sponsor is that. When I'm new, I walk in here and you guys are babbling at me. You, you're throwing all this jargon around, uh, like one day at a time, let it go. Uh, what the hell does that stuff mean? And, and, and that's what a sponsor does is translates the jargon of recovery. You know, if you wanna learn a foreign language, the best method of, of learning that foreign language is immersion. And the immersion is best accomplished in the company of somebody who already speaks the language. 
So my sponsor serves as my, my recovery, English, English recovery dictionary. Um, the sponsor helps me to find my path through the steps. Uh, in general, what we look for there is somebody who has the recovery that we want. This thing from the very beginning has always been about the idea, if you want what we've got, do what we did. Or if, if your problem looks like my problem, then the things that work for you might work for me. So a sponsor is someone who has achieved the recovery that I want and who's willing to share with me how they did that on the theory that if I, if I walk the same path, if I put my feet in his footprints, then maybe I get to the same place. So what are we supposed to look for when we're, when we're, when we're, we're new and we're looking around the rooms for a sponsor? Uh, there's a short piece here in, in sponsorship, what's in it for me. Uh, having a CODA sponsor gives us the chance to participate in and experience a healthier relationship. The best way to pick a sponsor is to remain open to guidance from our higher power. A few practical considerations follows. We start the process by considering what kind of person we might want as a sponsor. Do we want someone who requires daily contact or would we rather call less frequently? Okay. The only question there is what works? Okay. Both of those, uh, of those approaches, the, the daily contact or the weekly check-in uh, or call me when you need me, these are all viable solutions to similar problems, depending on the two people involved. And that's the thing that I need to stress is that every sponsorship relationship is a unique relationship between two unique people. So what works for me and this guy over here that I sponsor? is one thing. It might be different from what works between me and the guy who happens to be my sponsor. And that may be completely different from what works for these two other people over here. Recovery teaches me to, to uh, live life on life's terms, to accept what is. And so I, I, I try to cultivate the ability to never argue with success. So if what you're doing with your sponsor is completely different from what I would do, I don't have any argue with argument with that as long as it's working for you. Do we look for someone who gives assignments or do we prefer in-depth discussions? It's common for both to occur. Again, both of those are, are absolutely okay. It just depends on what works for that sponsor and that sponsee. Do we check out someone who is familiar but who may not possess those qualities for which we are striving? Ideally, we choose a sponsor who exhibits those, those characteristics that will allow us to meet our present needs. Personally, I, I'm not so keen on, on that phrasing um, because as I said, I, I want the guy who can show me to get where I want to go. Uh, hopefully he's got enough recovery under his belt that he'll meet me where I am and help me get there. In looking for a CODA sponsor, the following list helps us to discern qualities that are currently important to us. We are aware that mo most practical matters will work themselves out as the relationship progresses and the communication grows. Um, and there's this bullet list of characteristics of CODA sponsors. But most important thing that I would, I, I would come back to and stress again, who has the recovery that I want? Um, everything good that we have in, in, in CODA, is my opinion, we borrowed from Alcoholics Anonymous, including the idea of sponsorship. Sponsorship in Alcoholics Anonymous started uh, way back in the 1930s when, when a drunken proctologist in Akron, Ohio met a, a failed stockbroker who happened to be in town who'd been sober for a while and needed, needed to talk, talk to an alcoholic he could help. And they had this conversation and the proctologist came to the conclusion, this guy understands me, maybe he can help. And that's where sponsorship was born. And today that, that same principle applies, that idea that, that someone who, who has experienced the depths of the codependency, of the pain of the codependency that I suffered can help me get out of that because they found a way. If, if they found a way, 
the one thing I absolutely know is there is a way out. So what are the, some of the characteristics of, of a CODA sponsor? Um, from that list in, in, uh, in uh, sponsorship, what's in it for me? Uh, the place recovery first. That is so important to me today. Uh, I've learned here that, that anything that I put in front of my recovery, I am guaranteed to lose because here's the thing is that, that uh, my recovery is what equips me to, to be able to have and enjoy the good things in my life. And the minute that I put anything in, in the way of that, I'm guaranteed to lose it. A uh, sponsor commits in word and action to their own recovery. Word and action. In other words, they walk the talk. They don't, they don't just talk a good game. We can actually watch them going through their life, practicing the elements of their recovery. They have more recovery than we have. Um, that's pretty much a given. I, I, I don't want a guide that I'm going to have to show the way to. Um, in our older literature uh, on sponsorship, uh, uh, our old sponsorship booklet that's out of print these days, what it talked about as a minimum requirement for sponsorship was not uh, you know, having worked all 12 steps. It wasn't uh, you know, a, a certain set amount of time in CODA. What it talked about, you have to remember that, that, that when that booklet was written, CODA was a new fellowship. And there weren't a bunch of old timers around that had had time to go through all of the steps and, and build up all of that time in the fellowship. So what it talked about was as a minimum requirement was having done a fifth step. And the thinking, the theory there was that if, if somebody has made it as far as the fifth step, they have started to experience some real recovery and their position to be able to take that newcomer through those first three steps get them started on a four-step inventory. And if, you, if the sponsor could do that, then all they had to do was work their butt off to stay at least one step ahead of their sponsee. And, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And that is, that is the, the, the conversation that I have in the, with the guys that I sponsor today, is that once they've done a fifth step, I start encouraging them to make themselves available for sponsorship. Uh, CODA sponsor actively works the, the CODA 12 steps. You know, at the end of the day, CODA Penance Anonymous is a one trick pony. There's no, you know those patterns of CODA Penance that we read the newcomers? Right? To me, those are good news because CODA is a one trick pony. The only thing that CODA is good at is helping somebody who looks like that get better through a program of recovery. And that program of recovery is contained in our 12 steps. So the fact that I read those, those patterns of codependence and it's like a character study of Richard is great news for me because what it means is that, that, that I'm in the right place. And I wanna get better. So, so I actively engage in those 12 steps. I want a sponsor who, who looks at that the same way. A uh, CODA sponsor knows the CODA 12 traditions and applies them in their lives. Yeah. Our third tradition says that the only requirement for membership in CODA is a desire for healthy and loving relationships. And I, I, I believe that if that's true, then our 12 traditions are at least as important as the 12 steps. Because the 12 traditions, uh, as we talk about in, in our 12 piece relationship toolkit booklet, uh, the 12 traditions are guides to and tools for healthier relationships. The downside, the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the problem with that is that as near as I can tell after 18 years, uh, the 12 steps seem to be a prerequisite for working the 12 traditions successfully. I've, I've not seen anybody practice the 12 traditions in a sustainable and meaningful way unless they had first worked 12 steps. And so uh, I get some distance into the steps and my sponsors starts encouraging me to look at the traditions. I take a sponsee these days, 
certain distance through the steps. And then we start talking about the traditions. Uh, a good sponsor exhibits the recovery program that we want for ourselves. One more time, if you, if you want what we've got, do what we did. Uh, as CODA sponsor, are the, it says here, are the same ge gender as we are and are not sexually attractive to us. I need to point out that for a lot of our members, those are two different things. Um, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is that, that we want to keep any kind of romantic entanglements out of that sponsorship relationship, whatever is necessary to make that work. Uh, in general, what that means is, is that men sponsor men and women sponsor women, but at the end of the day, people sponsor people. And, and uh, I happen to believe that, that uh, uh, there's a sponsor out there for everybody, uh, no matter what, these little little rules might might indicate. Uh, Coda sponsor maintains personal boundaries in a non-aggressive manner. I really like that one. Um, it's kind of a litmus test for me in in terms of uh, how comfortable I am with someone else is how they set boundaries. You know, if someone says to me, I won't be able to call you on Sunday because that's my family time. Perfect. That, that, that is a, a well-stated, simple boundary. When someone says to me, um, I won't be able to call you on Sunday because that's my family time. You can't interfere with my family time because that's what my recovery is all about. You don't want to interfere with that. That's not somebody that I want to spend a lot of time with. That's, uh, when somebody gets aggressive about setting their boundaries that way, I start wondering, are you trying to convince me or you? Uh, and, and so a, 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 uh, a good CODA sponsor, I believe, uh, maintains personal boundaries in a non-aggressive manner because they're comfortable with those boundaries. Um, a good CODA sponsor is emotionally present. You know, meetings are such a great training ground for that. What do we learn in, in, in meetings with the no crosstalk rule? We learn active listening. We learn, we learn to be present to what's being shared. Uh, CODA sponsors are open-minded. Uh, I don't know about you, but I got here with, with a pretty solid case of black and white thinking, right? It, it was either good or bad. It was, it, it was yes or no, it was in or out. Uh, that living life in the extremes that is so common for some of us in, in, in our illness. Um, turns out that there's a whole lot of, of life that happens in between black and white. It's not, it may, there's all those shades of gray and all the colors of the rainbow are in between black and white. And that's where real life happens. And, and uh, uh, my sponsor's example of being open-minded and, and uh, uh, living within that middle that I was never interested in before encouraged me to, to dip my toe into, into the pool of real life. Uh, Coda sponsor accepts themselves and accepts us. One of the biggest things that I learned from my sponsors was to change my self-talk. When I got here, uh, Richard was Richard's number one critic. Uh, and, and consequently, um, what my sponsors taught me is that when I make a mistake and I spend a bunch of time and energy beating up on Richard, that's time and energy that I'm not putting into dealing with the situation and finding a solution. I'm, I'm, I'm expending energy that's going nowhere. Uh, and I'm hurting my self-esteem in the process. So consequently, I was encouraged not to talk to Richard the way that I always did. 
And consequently, it's been a very long time since I told Richard that he was a, 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 a piece of shit and a waste of skin and, and, and a complete utter moron. These days when I make a mistake, I, I try to have a, a kinder, more gentle conversation with Richard. I'd say things like, uh, well, that didn't go well. Let's try it differently next time. Or my, my personal favorite, uh, Richard, that was suboptimal. Let's not do it that way again. Uh, Coda sponsor respects our right to confidentiality. Um, one of the things that, that, that is really important to build over time, it's not there at the beginning, it, it never is, but, uh, but to build over time in, in a sponsorship relationship is trust. Our code of promises tell me that I will learn to trust those who are trustworthy, which that's awesome because I always did that the other way around before. Now, prior to recovery, I went through life uh, trusting people that I shouldn't have. And the reason I would trust them is because they, they had this magical power uh, to get me to trust them by saying things like, don't you trust me? Well, now I have to trust them or they'll think I don't trust them and, 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 and disapprove and, and, and my codependency doesn't let me, doesn't let me go there. Um, and then because I've been burned by trusting someone, someone else comes along that is trustworthy and they don't ask that magic question. And so I don't trust them either. And, and what's happened in, in uh, my sponsorship relationships is that I've learned that there are people that I can trust. And I've learned to tell the difference. Um, a code of sponsor listens with compassion and understanding without rescuing or give advice. You know, what we're asked to do here is, is to share our experience, strength, and hope, not our opinions. That's why I, I try, anytime that, that, that I have an opinion coming, I try to make sure that for your benefit that I label it, hey, this is an opinion. Um, what we're asked to do is, is, as sponsors is to share, oh, that's what's going on in your life. Well, when that, when that happened to me, this is what I did and this is how it turned out. You know? and, and, you know, sometimes with, with the guys that I sponsor, uh, when I say that, they go, oh, that's great. I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Um, and sometimes they'll say, oh, ooh, thanks for the warning. I, I, I'm going to try not to do that. And that's, that's what I've learned here is that, that, uh, uh, the best things that I can do is to be either a good example or a loud warning. Um, a CODA sponsor helps us to identify codependent behavior in a supportive and non-shaming way. This is important. And, and when, I, when I take on a sponsor, I give that sponsor what I think of as an unrestricted license to be honest with me, to tell me what he sees recognizing that, that the only reason he's telling me this is because he thinks it's in my best interest to know that. So it's, uh, uh, my sponsor is not going to tell me something simply, simply to make me feel bad, that the end objective is some kind of improvement in my life. And he's telling me this because he thinks it's important information that I have. Um, And so when a sponsor, I, I, when I take on a sponsor, I, I give them the heads up ahead of time, like sooner or later, I'm gonna say something that you don't wanna hear. And you need to understand it. It's not, it's not about criticizing you. It's about trying to offer you some, some useful information. Uh, Coda sponsor accepts that we might be working more than one program. I don't know if you, if you look around our rooms, you, you, you notice something that, that we're kind of the crossroads of the recovery community here. <laughs> you know, we have a, a lot of members who come in from other 12 step fellowships. I, in fact, most of the people that I know in CODA uh, are also members of some other fellowship. And 
that's uh, in my mind, that's, that's, that's natural. If you look at the early days of Codependence Anonymous at the founders of Codependence Anonymous and, and all of those first members, they were all people who had uh, uh, achieved some sobriety in, in uh, uh, AA or NA, uh, had some time clean and sober and discovered that they still had problems. And those problems seem to be centered around those other people in their life. And, and issues of codependency. And so they started this fellowship. So all of our early members were, were, were people coming in from other fellowships. Uh, and that's a part of our dynamic today. You know, uh, I, I think uh, I'm a little bit of an anomaly, although I am a member of another fellowship, I started in CODA and went to the other fellowship to find a sponsor actually. I'll get to that later. Um, uh, so a uh, 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 CODA sponsor accepts that we may be working more than, than one program. And our literature is clear on the subject that if, if, if there's a, a primary addiction at play, you know, alcohol, drugs, uh, gambling, sex, that addiction needs to be under control uh, before you can work a meaningful program here because you... Uh, until that, until that's stabilized, you can't hear what we have to say. Uh, a CODA sponsor respects and accepts our pace. I said that, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, uh, our preamble talks about how it's an individual growth process. Uh, it's part of why I am not a fan of, uh, of step groups, personally. Um, again, this is opinion alert, but uh, I believe that, it, that this is an individual growth process and, and uh, trying to get a bunch of people working the steps together at the same pace is, is not, in my opinion, um, uh, the best possible program for all of those people. There's always somebody who's, who, who's uh, being held back because they, they'd like to be working faster. There's always somebody who, who is rushing through the work and not doing it thoroughly in order to keep up. And, and I just don't see that as, as uh, uh, something that I want to participate in. Um, CODA sponsor provides loving support for us and encourages us to reach out to others. Uh, our friends in Northern California uh, have a document where they talk about the, uh, the uh, rule of five. The idea that my recovery can never be uh, uh, centered on and anchored by just one person, that, that I need a network of at least five people that I can be uh, in connection with in support of my recovery. Now, the primary, for me, the primary of those is my sponsor. That's the first place I go, but my, my sponsor is not available 24-7, 365. And sometimes I need to talk stuff out and I, and I need to talk now and I need somebody that I can that I can trust with that and and so I have a bunch of other people that I can talk to if my sponsor is not available. Uh, CODA sponsor communicates clearly and directly. One of the things that we learn here is to be open, honest, and direct. A CODA sponsor does not speak in code. Um, I had a boss who, who would, was just one of the most indirect people I'd, I, I've ever met. And he would say things to me like, uh, Richard, this is serious. That, you know, the, the wall is green, if, if you know what I mean. And I would have to say to him, Dave, I don't know what you mean. You're going to have to be clearer than that. Um, a CODA sponsor does not play those games. A CODA sponsor is open, honest, and direct with us. A uh, CODA sponsor asks us questions for clarity, not to control, judge, or manipulate us. Um, the other purpose in asking questions, though, is that uh, when my sponsor asks me questions to clarify a situation, it doesn't just clarify it for him, it clarifies it for me. Um, and when he asks me to, to uh, think about situation with a new question. I may consider it from an angle that I haven't seen before 
and I supply my own answers. I think a good sponsor recognizes the idea that, that uh, it's more important to bring the right questions than it is to bring the right answers. Uh, Coda sponsor has a sense of humor. This is so important to me. Um, part of it is I think, I think of that sense of humor as the seven step in action. You know, uh, the seven step, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. How can I tell when my higher power has removed a shortcoming? Well, when it becomes funny. You know, when, the, when, when that pattern of codependence that I couldn't not do that was ruining my life that, that was in charge becomes a belly laugh. It's not in charge anymore. And so I want a sponsor who can laugh about the things that he used to do because I want to get to that point. And I, I, I tell uh, a lot of the guys that I sponsor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to laugh a lot when we talk, but you need to understand, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the me that I used to be. It's the laughter of identification. And finally, uh, Coda sponsor knows how to play. Yeah. At the end of the day, what do we really want? We want to, we want to enjoy life. Uh, I think a big part of, of being able to enjoy life is learning to play. And so I, I get to play a lot more today than I ever did. I watch my sponsor play and, and delight in, in, in watching his delight. So those, those are some of the characteristics that we can look for in a sponsor. How do we ask for sponsorship? Once we've identified somebody and we go, okay, that's, that's, that's my guy. Well, our seven tradition talks about being self-supporting. Um, when, we, when we talk about that spiritual principle of being self-supporting, we don't just mean financially. We don't just mean paying our own way uh, or the group paying its own way. Um, I try to be self-supporting financially, yes, but also physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Being spiritually self-supporting means that I'm responsible for my recovery. Uh, and so we... we we make it the sponsee's responsibility to ask for sponsorship. That's one of the, one of the great things about CODA is that you, you are typically going to see somebody uh, chasing down the newcomer in the meeting and say, hey, hey, I'm your sponsor. <laughs> it's, we leave that decision up to, uh, up to the sponsee and we encourage them to take responsibility for asking. And how do we do that? Well, we, we suggest that they be open, honest, and direct. The best way in my mind to, to ask for sponsorship is to literally go to somebody and say, I love the recovery that I see in your life. Will you please show me how you did that? Uh, or I love, I love what I hear from you. Do you have time in your life to take me through this process? Open, honest, and direct. Um, before getting to that stage, what we encourage, encourage newcomers to do is to come to the meetings, listen, get to know people, stay for the fellowship after the meeting. I, I personally love meetings that, that you know, this goes back to the brick and mortar pre-COVID days, but uh, I love meetings that go for coffee because meeting groups that go for coffee after the meeting, that's, that's where the real recovery happens. That's where where you, you have uh, the, the time to get to know somebody. And that's where, where relationships actually can begin. That's where someone can transition from being um, uh, a, a, you know, a senior member of the group to a mentor to an actual sponsor. What happens if they say no? I mean, I, I, first time I asked someone to be my sponsor, my heart was bursting out of my chest. I was, I, I, I was terrified that they were gonna reject me. 
and I'm I'm grateful today that that they didn't. But that can happen. Sometimes people have to say no because uh, they're too busy. They have too many sponsees. They have uh, they have something going on in their life that 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 makes them uh, unbeknownst to the to the newcomer uh, ill-equipped to be a sponsor right now. So the first thing that I would urge you to remember is if somebody says no, is, is that it's probably not about you. That's a, that's a tough hurdle to get over for some of us because I don't know about you, but I got here uh, with this horrible combination of, of uh, low self-esteem and extreme self-centeredness. You know, I saw myself as the piece of shit at the center of the universe. I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. And, and uh, that idea of it's not about you, that of not taking it personally is so important to keep in mind. Just to recap, what the attributes of an effective sponsor. Um, first of all, it's gonna be somebody who's committed to their own recovery. Right. If they're not committed to their own recovery, why are we even interested in them? There's someone who is immersed in the steps and the traditions. You know, another opinion alert. Uh, if, except for the steps and the traditions, if, if you take those out of what we do, we're just really crappy group therapy. Because there's, there's not a licensed therapist in the bunch, right? Uh, the steps and the traditions are what we are about. So if I want to guide through this, I want somebody who knows that path. Um, an effective sponsor has a sponsor. If, uh, if I'm going to go looking for a guide, I want to know, I want the confidence of knowing that, that, that my guide has a guide. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, an effective CODA sponsor attends meetings. And they, it, it, uh, uh, may seem like that doesn't have to be said, but unfortunately it does. Uh, that uh, it's a little hard to be a sponsor in Codependence Anonymous if you're, if you're not active in Codependence Anonymous. So where do we find a sponsor? Uh, our literature talks about first in our home group. Go to, go to your home group meetings and listen and get to know people until you find that person who, when they share, you sit up a little straighter. You listen a little more closely. That's probably a good candidate. If for some reason there is no suitable candidate in your group. When I, when I walked into my, my first CODA meeting, it was me and six women who terrified me. Uh, the literature talks about go to a neighboring CODA group and, and see if there's someone there. In my case, there was no neighboring CODA groups. There wasn't another uh, another CODA group within a, a, a six hour drive of Saskatoon. Uh, in which case our older literature talks about uh, going to another fellowship and at least finding somebody who understands the, the basics of the steps and the traditions and, and, and ask them for help. That's what I ended up doing for my first sponsor. Uh, Couple of other things that, that I've learned over time is that a really good source of, of uh, sponsorship candidates is referral. If you find somebody that you respect, but they're not for whatever reason, a suitable sponsorship candidate, ask them. You've been around longer than I have. Do you know anybody that, that I might wanna go ask or that I would at least wanna get to know? And uh, I saw a note in the chat, of, is there a list available of sponsors we can contact? And that is starting to happen. The uh, Coda UK started a, 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 a sponsorship registry uh, this year. And uh, if you get in touch with the uh, Coda UK Unity Committee, uh, it's a guy named Frank who's, who's overseeing that one, I believe. Um, they can put you in touch with somebody there. At the same time, Coda Canada just started a, a, a registry. For years now at the Coda Service Conference every year, and by the way, the Coda Service Conference is happening this, com this coming week. Uh, they have taken, uh, they've, they've basically passed around a sign-up sheet 
to all of the delegates and their trusted servants there who are typically veteran CODA members, are you willing to, to serve as a long distance sponsor if someone gets in touch with you? And uh, they, they collect a new batch of names and phone numbers every year. So yes, there are, there are these repositories of that information out there um, within your group or within your service structure, just, just ask around and, and see where you can, can uh, be referred. Um, now we get into maybe the thing that, that, that is most important for me to talk about today. And, and that is, how can a sponsee make the most of their relationship with their sponsors? I, I preface this whole thing by saying I'm responsible for precisely 50% of the successes and 50% of the failures in my relationships. And that includes my sponsorship relationship. Um, so, I, and this is just my own experience coming. But first and foremost, uh, the most important thing I can do is pick up the phone. Um, if I'm going to have a sponsor, I should use that sponsor. I can tell you that there are dozens and dozens and dozens of guys out there who call me their sponsor. Um, a significant percentage of them I hear from on a regular basis, I, I talk with, I share with, I get to be their sponsor. But there's another big chunk of those guys who they call me their sponsor, but they never call me. You know, and and if they just want to, for whatever reason, call me their sponsor, that's okay with me. I hope that eventually I will get the opportunity to actually sponsor them. But that's not what's happening in that relationship. Uh, but the door's open and that's just fine with me. But if that, if that sponsee wants, wants to make use of me as a sponsor, he picks up the phone and we talk. Um, Another thing that's really important to me is what I refer to, or what I think of as a commitment to consideration. Um, that commitment that I'm, I make to myself, not to my sponsor, but to myself that this is the guy that I chose as a guy. This is a guy that, that has walked the path that I wanna go. It doesn't matter how stupid, how unappealing, how, how unattractive what he says to me might be. I, I have an obligation to myself to at least consider it. Uh, and I may, you know, this, one of the most important things that I talk about with, with new sponsees is I can't tell you what to do. My sponsor can't tell me what to do. I am the final decision maker in my life. But I have this obligation to myself to at least consider what I've what I hear from my sponsor. My very first phone call to my current sponsor, this is, my current sponsor was my third sponsor. Um, and it was just, it was, the relationship was brand new and, and we're just getting to know each other. And, you know, I'm, I'm codependent. I, I kind of want to impress my sponsor. So I tell him this cute little story, this, this thing I've been doing in, in some of the meetings, uh, just to kind of tweak some people that disagree with me on some stuff and, and, and it just I kind of in, enjoy their reaction. And it's, it's in an area where I know, I know he's in agreement with me. So it's like, this, this will impress me. And, and the phone goes dead for a moment. It's always a bad sign when the phone, when you're talking to your sponsor and the phone goes dead. And he says, Richard, that's really funny. And I, I might even use that myself if I find myself in a, in a situation with some like-minded people. But if you're doing that simply to show your disdain for their opinion and, their, and for, for their approach to recovery, we don't do that. To which I replied, um, I gotta go, bye. Five minutes later, I phoned it back and I said, Jack, it's been a very long time since anybody held me accountable. I didn't like it then and I don't like it now, but apparently it's necessary, so thank you. My sponsor, by the way, loves to tell that story. Um, so a commitment to considering whatever it is, because here's what happened, is that he told me something I didn't want to hear. And I had to consider that. 
and I, I came to realize that uh, I don't get to amuse myself at, some, at the expense of someone else's comfort. And I grew. That's an important outcome from that sponsorship relationship. Uh, another important uh, thing that, that a sponsee can do is engaging consistency. Uh, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, that commitment to, to doing the work that, that the, our sponsor recommends and, and actually setting the time aside to do that. Uh, I have all sorts of sponsees who, who um, get bogged down trying to do a four-step inventory because uh, uh, that's just, a, it's a big thing. And, and, and they're looking at the whole thing uh, and, and trying to get it all done at once, it seems. And it's like, no, no. If you will, just 15 minutes a day, take that piece of paper out for 15 minutes a day and look at it. Fine with me if you don't even get out a pen and write it, just look at it for 15 minutes a day. But if you'll do that, you'll be surprised how quickly this gets done. And they always are surprised at how quickly it gets done if they will do that. Uh, consistency in attending the meetings. You know, when I was new, the people who, who had what I wanted uh, uh, all talked about the same things. They talked about uh, uh, being in the meetings. They talked about working the steps. They talked about having a sponsor. Uh, and I, I learned from that. And so I treat the meetings like a doctor's appointment. Um, I talk to the sponsor, to the people I sponsor about something I refer to as gentle, persistent effort. The idea being that, that uh, we've, in our codependency, we have a tendency to have been hard on ourselves. We need, we need to learn to be gentle with self. We're not trying to sprain something here. We're not trying to get better in one day. Uh, but at the same time, we need to practice persistent effort. That idea of continuing uh, to put one foot in front of the other, to, to when the going gets tough, uh, we just continue to put one foot in front of the other. We don't stop and wallow in the pain. Um, and, and the way that I think of that is that when I was brand new, uh, a friend who had 25 years of uh, of uh, recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous shared with me that she had in, in her early recovery made a commitment to herself that, that every day in her recovery, she would talk to another alcoholic. Now that might mean talking to her sponsor, it might mean going to a meeting and talking to people there. It might mean taking a call from a sponsee. It might mean going on a 12 step call, but every day she would talk to another alcoholic in support of her own recovery. That made sense to me. And so I made, a, I made a commitment to myself that every day I would do something measurable, something that I could point at at the end of the day in support of my own recovery. So that, and that may be, that may be going to a meeting. It may be reading a piece of literature that I wouldn't ordinarily read. It may mean talking to my sponsor. It may mean taking a call from a sponsee, but just something that I can point at at the end of the day and say, I've moved the goalposts on my recovery just a little bit today. Uh, and I talked about it earlier. Uh, something that a sponsee can do to improve the relationship with a sponsor is to focus on self-talk, is to change the relationship of how I talk to myself. Because when I'm busy beating up on myself, I can't hear what my sponsor's saying. So those are some of the things that I can suggest, but... Uh, Again, it comes down to that idea of, of being available and listening and considering and being consistent. So let's talk about different types of sponsorship. Most of what I've been talking about here today has, has been about personal sponsorship. And just to give you the, I should, probably should have done this at the beginning, just to give you the Reader's Digest version of my sponsorship journey. You know, I started off in that, in that group, it was me and six women. And I, I, our literature said that I needed a sponsor. If I couldn't find a sponsor in my group, go to a neighboring group. Well, there's no neighboring groups. Then go to another, uh, another fellowship 
And that's what I ended up doing. And I ended up in another fellowship where I fit like a glove. I'm just as active there as I am here. Uh, and I found a guy who, who looked just like Santa Claus and had this voice that sounded just like James Earl Jones doing the voice of God. So it looked like Santa Claus, sound like God. This was my sponsor. And he was uh, all about unconditional love, all about complete acceptance. And I was so fragile at that time um, that that's exactly what I needed. I'm pretty sure that I could have phoned him up one night and said, uh, Ron, I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, she wouldn't stop talking. I had this ax in my hand and there's blood everywhere. And I feel, I, I feel horrible. And he would have said to me, Richard, aren't you being a little hard on yourself? And that's, that's what the acceptance that I needed at the time. But after a while, I needed more guidance. I, I, I was chafing at the bit, trying, trying to make my way through the steps, and I needed more than that. And so I, I found a guy who, who could offer me that. And what my obligation to that first sponsor was, is to go to him and to say, thank you for, for getting me as far as you have, for everything that you've done. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm, I'm going with this guy now. And, and uh, you know, today, uh, I, I periodically have that kind of conversation with somebody who decided to make a change in sponsorship. And all they owe me is a thank you for getting them as far as I have. But because it's not about me. It's about being a conduit for something more important than me to help them get better. And, and I can take a great deal of satisfaction in knowing that I helped the guy outgrow me. Second sponsor eventually kind of just drifted away on me and I ended up uh, needing another sponsor. And at that time, uh, I was trying to learn to be a better sponsor. And I found myself spending a weekend with a guy, uh, uh, watching him take phone calls from sponsees. And it was like, for me, it was like a weekend clinic in sponsorship. It was like, this is my guy. And that's what my experience is. My higher power will bring into my life the people that I need at the moment I need them. And that guy is my sponsor today. Uh, at the same time, we have another type of sponsorship called co-sponsorship. Uh, a month after I walked into that first CODA meeting, another guy walked in. And I latched onto him uh, in a room full of women, uh, like a drowning man to a life preserver. And today he is my co-sponsor. That's Ian B from Saskatoon. And, and, and some of you know him from some stuff that he's done here. Uh, for 17 years, uh, 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 he has been the guy that I, that I go to when my sponsor's busy. And uh, uh, he is closer to me than any of my brothers today. We also talk about, uh, or co-sponsorship is really about that idea that you take two people who are at about the same point in recovery and they sponsor each other. They help each other move forward. It's built on one simple pre premise and that is the idea that we're not both sick on the same day. And so that's worked out pretty well for Ian and me over the years. Um, um, there's been, been a few occasions where it has absolutely saved my life to, to have him in my life. Uh, temporary sponsorship. Temporary sponsorship is really uh, the idea of, of a sponsor taking a sponsee on with the recognition from both sides that, that, that that's not a permanent relationship, that, uh, that uh, uh, this is just being able to offer that sponsee some guidance until a permanent sponsor can be found. Right? I will actively, if I'm somebody's temporary sponsor, I will actively help look around the landscape for someone uh, to be their permanent sponsor. But at the same time, a lot of those relationships end up becoming permanent. Right? There are several guys that I have been their temporary sponsor for upwards of 10 years. Um, uh, but what we know is, and I, I'm not sure I understand the dynamic, but what, what I know from observation and experience is that it seems to be a lot easier for, for 
codependents to ask someone to be their temporary sponsor than it is to be their sponsor. Uh, and, and so consequently, we encourage people to ask someone to be their temporary sponsor. In my home group, uh, we encourage member veteran members, if they are available to be a temporary sponsor, to put an asterisk beside their name in the sign up list and, and on the phone list. Uh, and these days in Zoom meeting, uh, uh, beside their screen name. So we, we actively make uh, clear who is available for temporary sponsorship. Uh, another type of sponsorship is, is uh, shared sponsorship. And that is, is a situation where someone might have two sponsors and those two sponsors have that person's permission to talk about them with each other. Uh, what that does is it cuts down on, on, on opinion shopping for starters, which is one of the to most toxic things that a sponsee can do to harm their own recovery and the guidance that they get from their sponsor. Uh, a situation where that might come up is you know, a few years ago, a young woman came into our home group and, and for whatever reason, she wanted, uh, want, wanted me to be her sponsor. And I don't typically sponsor women. But my wife and I took her on and, and together. Uh, my wife sponsors a legion of women in, the, in this fellowship. And, and what that did was it, it, it gave her the comfort whatever, for whatever that was worth of having me for a sponsor and being able to talk to me. But at, at the same time, uh, gave her access to my wife's uh, wisdom and, and insights. And, and, and uh, uh, ultimately, I'm pleased to report that what happened is that uh, I became a superfluous to that relationship. <laughs> um, so a shared sponsorship is, is that idea of, of having more than one voice, but some consistency of, of um, not compartmentalizing that sponsorship uh, relationship. Uh, another type of sponsorship that's pretty common, especially these days, uh, is long distance sponsorship. I think effective uh, March of last year, pretty much every sponsorship relationship became a long distance relationship. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that, that I was sponsoring people in far flung parts of the world for a long time before that even happened. Uh, my current sponsor lives in California. Uh, and and uh, so I can tell you that, that long distance sponsorship uh, can work out pretty successfully. The downside is that you don't necessarily get to be eyeball to eyeball with that person on a weekly basis. And there's a real, in my mind, there's a real advantage and comfort in, in being able to be in the same meeting with my sponsor on a weekly basis, especially when I, when I was new. Uh, and then one other uh, type of sponsorship that you, you sometimes see uh, and uh, not as common in, in Codependence Anonymous, but I think it's becoming more, is service sponsorship. And service sponsorship is similar to, to personal sponsorship, but it's, it's uh, uh, focused on the business side of things. It's, it's when we get involved in service. And that can be confusing. I mean, CODA is great at getting people into jobs that they're ill-equipped for. And then uh, as soon as they start getting good at the job, rotation of service kick, kicks in and we get them out of that job, put somebody else in. <laughs> and and uh, what service sponsorship is about is finding somebody who's, who, who's got the experience to, to offer me some guidance in that position, right? I have a service sponsor in CODA. Uh, uh, I'm currently serving on the core board, and I'm also serving as the chair of our voting entity here at Coda Canada. Uh, my current uh, service sponsor is somebody who has done both of those jobs. So when something comes up and I'm confused, and I don't know, like, who do I call? How do I handle this? I've got somebody who I can, I can phone, and he can say, well, when that happened to me, this is what I did. And what it does is it, it, it just gives me uh, somewhere to go for, for the kind of, of uh, uh, guidance that, that 
I need in order to successfully navigate uh, uh, service in CODA without, without becoming uh, either homicidal or suicidal. So um, finally, final question that we have is, how do we break up with a sponsor? What happens when that relationship has run its course? And some, sometimes it will, right? Sponsorship is not a life sentence. Sponsorship is the coming together of two people for a purpose to enhance both their recoveries. And sometimes for whatever reason, that just stops working or uh, one or the other party moves out of the area and, and the sponsee decides that they, they, they want somebody local. Or you know, when, I, when I moved a few years ago from Saskatoon to Winnipeg, I had two or three guys that, that I was sponsoring at the time who decided they'd rather not have a long distance sponsor. Most of the guys that, 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 uh, that I was sponsoring stuck with me and they became long distance sponsees. And they were really happy when I moved back to Saskatoon. But uh, uh, if a change is necessary, uh, that's just part of the natural course of things. So what do, we, what do we do? Well, I already told you what I did. I went to my first sponsor and I said, uh, uh, I want to thank you for getting me as far as, uh, as you have. Uh, I really appreciate everything that you've done and I need to make a change. If I'm the sponsor in that situation, my job in that is to be okay with it. My ego is not attached to being a sponsor to any of the guys that I sponsor. And that's again, if I can, I can't stress this enough uh, is that uh, sponsorship is not about me. Uh, if a sponsee is, it finds it necessary to move on, it's not about me. And I hope that if you ever find that necessary, you've got a sponsor who's, who's got enough recovery to recognize that. So that is the gist of what I have to say about sponsorship. Other than, let me add one more point. I, a lot of you will have, have come here today because you're interested in finding a sponsor. A lot of you, if my experience is any guide, are going to be a little nervous about asking that question. Uh, first of all, most of the people that are going to be good candidates to be sponsors are, are, are probably someone who's been around for a while and they're, they're spending a bunch of their time in their recovery in the 12 step these days. When we start doing that, um, our recovery becomes dependent on the people that we get to work with. So by not asking somebody to be your sponsor, you're actually, <laughs> in a way, interfering with their 12th step. You're, you're getting in the way of their recovery by not asking. At the same time, uh, if they are a good candidate for sponsorship, they are almost certainly willing to sponsor. If they're not willing to sponsor, they're probably not the, they're probably not the good candidate you thought they were in the first place. Uh, a good candidate for sponsorship wants to say yes. They're looking for an excuse to say yes. Some of them may even be looking at you in the meeting going, geez, I, 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 I secretly hope they ask me. So that does wind up everything that I have to say uh, on the subject today, unless we have some interesting questions that I would love to participate in answering. I had a sponsee over the last few years who, who early on had a, had a problem with rage and uh, uh, would call me up uh, and, and in his victimhood, as he got more and more hooked into his victimhood, he would start screaming. And uh, one of the most important things for me to recognize is that uh, uh, he's doing that with me. Um, and I, kn I know this is a relationship that he is terrified of losing. If he's doing it with me, it's because he feels safe with me. I, need to, I needed to remember that. Yes, I still need to set a boundary because it's unacceptable behavior, but I, I need to recognize that, that 
in a weird way, him doing it with me is actually a compliment. So just to, to pick up on that, uh, um, I introduced myself at, at the beginning and uh, the way I've introduced myself everywhere. I'm Richard and I'm codependent as hell. And part of the reason that I do that is to remind myself that I, you know, I'm better today than I was when I walked in, but I'm not well, that I, I still need a sponsor. Uh, and you know, I talk to my sponsor these days and, and uh, if only to check my thinking. And, and what happens is uh, Jack will say to me, Richard, well, you know, most of the time he'll say, that sounds like you've ever really thought that out well. It sounds like you got a handle on it, good for you. Once in a while, he'll say to me, uh, Richard, that sounds fairly well thought out. Uh, have you considered this thing over here? But every once in a while, he'll say to me, Richard, did you think that up yourself? Because it's a doozy. <laughs> and and the, the problem for me is that the, the gold-plated, uh, uh, really well thought out idea and the doozy from inside here look exactly the same. That's why I still need a sponsor today is because I'm still capable of that kind of thinking. Can I suggest to you that, that part of what happens with, with, a, with a sponsor is that uh, uh, we get to share more deeply with a sponsor. We get to share more completely and we get to get it off our chest so that it doesn't have to show up in the meetings because the meetings aren't about our problems. The, the meetings are, are about solutions. The meetings are about uh, uh, sharing a message of experience, strength, and hope. And I, I, I'm forever frustrated with this idea that the meetings where I have to take my problems. Um, uh, you know, we're given three to five minutes to share in a meeting. Uh, we don't really have the opportunity to get deep into a problem in three to five minutes. Uh, what the meetings are, 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 are about is, is those short, uh, concise snippets of recovery that we share with each other. My sponsor is where I bring the problems. So, uh, and the other thing that, that you're, you're concerned about there is the, uh, the uh, uh, people-pleasing behavior. Is it possible but that by engaging in the process of the steps that you might find some freedom from that people-pleasing behavior? Even with your sponsor, I already, I already commented on on the toxicity that is opinion shopping. The idea of my sponsor didn't uh, didn't tell me what I want to hear, so I'm going to go uh, try to get my other sponsor to sign off on it. Um, uh, what I encourage with those guys is to compartmentalize the the issues in their life. Most of the guys that I sponsor that are in another fellowship, they're in another fellowship where they're talking about sobriety in some form. Um, and so I encourage them that, you know, that others, I, I, I have no opinion, I have no experience, I have nothing to offer on the subject of that sobriety. I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not a drug addict. I've, I've got nothing to offer there. If it's a question related to that, you, you go listen to that sponsor. I, I have nothing to add. If it's a question about relationships and codependency, then I encourage you to talk to me about it. Uh, you know, clearly, the, your other sponsor and your other fellowship don't have the answers that you need there, or you wouldn't be here in the first place. So just try to prioritize what kind of question am I talking about and, and which voice is, gonna, is going to be the important one and only ask that one so as not to have that confusion of two voices. On the other hand, with most of the guys that I sponsor, when they do share with me opinions from their, their sponsor in that other fellowship, most of the time it's stuff that I'm strongly in agreement with. Well, I, I, I've known a few people who were you know, therapists or counselors uh, and also in recovery and the ones that I admire and respect are the ones who leave their credentials at the door. Mm -hmm. That uh, they they have a very distinct line between what they do for a living and, and their recovery. Uh, I I don't know what you were dealing with there. What I what I can say is that uh, uh, you know while I I don't question how you experienced that, 
I would encourage you to consider that, that if she became unavailable for sponsorship, it was almost certainly not about you. That, uh, uh, that may be the way you, you experienced it, but, but I suspect that the reality of the situation was something happened in her life and uh, uh, whatever she was doing in terms of sponsorship, she stopped doing with you and others. Uh, and what I, what I heard in what you were sharing there was, you know, when I was new, they took away my mind reading license because I, I, I turned out I was really shitty at it. <laughs> um, when I get a new sponsee, we, we typically have a conversation where we talk about the, the, the reality of or the, or the, the need for phone calls. Um, that I encourage my sponsees that when there's something happening in their life, if the thought occurs to them, maybe I should talk to Richard about this, that they reach out. Um, that it's not, it's not the sponsee's place to try to decide whether the sponsor is too busy to take the call. One of the fringe benefits of being a sponsor is it teaches us boundaries. It's by being a sponsor that I've, I've cultivated the ability to be able to say to somebody, uh, I'm just sitting down to dinner, can I call you back in a half an hour? Or I'm tied up for the, for the moment, can I call you at 10 o'clock tonight? Um, and, and to be able to not put my life on hold based on someone else's uh, 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 urgent situation. And uh, I would encourage you, if you do find a, a, a sponsor, to, to recognize that, that their job in that situation is to have boundaries. Our job as sponsees is to pick up the phone. Uh, 